Good morning, members. We are going to get started. So if you could do me a favor and please take your seat. And will Aaron please send us live when you're ready. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our legislative briefing for the upcoming legislative session. As many of you know, every year the Joint Fiscal Office organizes this important briefing to ensure that we all enter the session grounded in Vermont's revenues and budgetary pr pressures, and also take the opportunity to highlight a few policy areas that will be coming up during the legislative session. This year's briefing is especially critical as we address the end of the historic federal funds coming into our state and the urgent need to ensure that these dollars get out the door in a timely manner. Here's an overview of today's agenda in case you haven't seen it yet. This morning we'll start by hearing from Tom Cavett with an update on the revenue, budget, and economic outlook. We'll also have a presentation from some of our terrific JFO staff, Emily, Maria, Chris, on the fiscal year 2025 budget context. Following their conversation, we'll have Marsha Howard, Executive Director of the Federal Funds Information for States, will provide us a federal update. After that, we will break for lunch, and then we'll, we will return here in the chamber to hear from more Collins, Sue Minter, and Gus Seeley to provide a housing update. And our final presentation for today will be from Doug Farnham, Chief Recovery Officer, who will provide an update on the flood recovery updates. It's going to be an informative day. We want to thank the legislative staff and the presenters for taking the time to brief us all. I'm sure they will do a terrific job. Members, this summer and fall, I traveled around the state meeting with Vermonters across all 14 counties, and it was a wonderful opportunity to discuss the issues that are impacting their daily lives. Communities are finding creative solutions to get more housing online, create and grow businesses, all while fostering a stronger, more resilient community connections. And while there is a lot to celebrate, there is a tremendous amount of work ahead to make Vermont a healthier and safer state. Public health and safety was brought up in almost every conversation I had with Vermonters. Communities big and strong, big and small, are wrestling with how they can support those who are struggling. The recent shooting of three young Palestinian men was horrifying, and we are seeing an alarming increase in harassment and hate related to hate-related incidents across our state. And I hope that you will all join me in taking every action possible to soundly reject hate. Hate has no home here. <laughs> Members, we also have communities across the state, including our capital, suffer catastrophic devastation in the July floods. Vermonters worked tirelessly and are committed to come back stronger and more resilient. This session will focus on flood recovery and identify critical policies for climate resilience that take the action needed to prepare for our new climate reality. And as a reminder, all ARPA funds must be obligated by December 31st, 2024, and there are over $6 million of unobligated funds. We will continue to work with the administration to make sure that they have a plan to get these dollars out the door to Vermonters ahead of this deadline. Earlier this month, I asked members to participate in a survey on housing needs in their community. The responses cross party lines and geographical differences. We share so much in common and have the same desire to do all we can to make Vermont a better state. Despite the challenges before us, I know we will work together with respect and a spirit of collaboration, keeping Vermonters in the responsibility they are entrusting us with the forefront of our minds throughout the session. We have a lot to be thankful and proud of in this state. But we all know that there is much more to be done, and we'll do it together. Well, with that, I will turn the podium over to Senator Baruth. Thank you. Good morning. 
When I was sworn in last year, I tried to warn the incoming freshman senators that as no, often as not in this building, we find ourselves working on emergencies and crises that no one saw coming. I said, and I quote, no matter how careful we are, the truth is that the crises we can all see are only a small part of what we will eventually face together. Inevitably, there will be completely unforeseen emergencies that we can't even imagine as we sit here today, end quote. I spoke those words. I apparently jinxed all of us, and I apologize for that today. The flooding that we saw was unprecedented, but we had each other to lean on to solve those complex problems. We'll continue working on that this session. As we look forward to that coming session, we know we have more than a few complex issues before us. Climate change is causing more extreme and more frequent natural disasters, and the impacts disproportionately affect rural, low and moderate income, and marginalized Vermonters. Vermonters experience firsthand the gaps in the state's flood response and recovery efforts, and we must look for solutions to enhance our disaster preparedness going forward. As Vermont continues to rebuild and recover from this summer's devastating flooding, we must prior prioritize both climate change mitigation and resilience measures to address climate risk and rebuild smarter and stronger with resilience against future flooding events. Those weather events this summer also exacerbated what we all know is Vermont's housing and homeless crisis. Housing shortages have kept vacancy rates low, median rent prices high, and they have increased all the barriers to home ownership, especially for low and moderate income Vermonters. We must, and we will, prioritize statewide access to stable, affordable housing to build a thriving, resilient, and vibrant future for all Vermonters. Just want to take a moment to thank the Joint Fiscal Office. Their work will be uh, apparent today, but their effort sort of goes invisible, and I want to recognize it. They've done a great job preparing an agenda for today, and we know the briefing will provide us all with crucial information. The speaker and I want to thank the staff who have worked hard not only to make today possible, but to help prepare us for the upcoming session. And I'll throw in my great thanks to Ledge Council for their preparations as well. We're incredibly lucky. <clears throat> We're incredibly lucky to have such experienced, dedicated public servants supporting us in our legislative work. Also, please know that as we go into the new session, you can always reach out to my office or the speaker's office at any time, and we will help you in any way that we can. Now let me turn it back to Catherine Benham to introduce our next speaker. Uh, good morning. I'm Catherine Benham. I'm the Chief Fiscal Officer with the Joint Fiscal Office, and I thank you all for participating. Uh, the goal here is to provide information to you all and give you some context as you prepare for the upcoming session. Um, as you heard earlier, the morning is really broad picture vision about uh, various issues, and then this afternoon will be about two specific topics. Um, I would ask if you would let the presenters get through their presentations, and then we will have some Q&A at the end of each presentation. For those people on Zoom, if you could uh, send your questions in the chat, uh, Aaron and Sorcha, who are sitting here, will get those questions into the queue. Um, if we don't get to your questions, there is an email, ask JFO, um, and you can send questions to us at any point on time. Um, so with that, let me introduce Tom Cavett. You know, he's our legislative economist. He works with the administration's economist to do a consensus forecast, and there will be a consensus forecast in January. And so Tom, take it away. Thank you very much, Catherine. I'm going to contradict Catherine just a little bit, just to start with. Feel free to ask questions anytime. Um, I kind of prefer to just have that flow, but um, it's also okay to send them in. That's 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 okay too. Um, uh, as you all know, in in January we're going to do a complete budget and and revenue forecast update, uh, and uh, this is just sort of a sneak peek at what's happening in the economy and how it's been affecting revenues. 
Normally, we do this a few days later than December 1st, and so we have data from the month of November in, which is useful, and uh, this year we didn't, so I'm, I'm talking numbers that go through October, even though I've watched all the November numbers as they sort of pile up, but the end of the month true up sometimes has surprises, and uh, so um, uh, I'll be referring to November's numbers, but uh, I, we're, we're using the first third of the year, not the, not the first quarter for, um, uh, first quarter, I mean, instead of the uh, first third. So uh, with that, we'll um, get started here. So there, there, there has probably never been a bigger disconnect between the way people think about and see and perceive the economy to be and the data that we look at. I'll, I'll show you some consumer sentiment numbers a little bit later, but they're down like in recessionary territory, like about as bad as they've ever been. And uh, yet the economy's been growing at, at very solid rates, surprisingly high. Consumers keep spending. Uh, inflation has, has dropped dramatically. Doesn't mean there's deflation. That's really different because prices are just going up at a slower rate uh, after having gone up at a very quick rate, and that, that explains, I think, a lot of the uh, angst that people have about the economy. But uh, inflation's uh, uh, dropping. Uh, unemployment has never been lower. It's ticked up a little bit, but it's, it's close to record lows. Um, and uh, uh, wealth is also still uh, relatively high, and there are better distributional effects with that wealth than there has uh, uh, been for about 50 years. It's not like there's some sea change in the distribution of wealth, but uh, uh, during the pandemic, some of the lowest uh, uh, quintiles of, of income and wealth uh, did rise more than some of the, the highest ones. So. Uh, uh, there, there, there are things in the numbers that we look at and we say, you know, not bad. And in the first half of fiscal 24, generally the economy has been a little bit better than, uh, than was uh, expected. There are a lot of headwind, headwinds that are going to be uh, uh, slowing things in the second half of the year. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, about that. If we look at revenues through October, um, there and across all three funds, they're about two and a half percent higher than what we expected. And after November comes in, they'll probably be about one percent higher than we expected. Both of those are pretty much rounding errors. So it's basically revenues are really close to where we expected them to be. Under the covers, there's some movement. Personal income's been strong. Corporate income's been weaker than expected. Uh, you know, there are a few outliers, especially in some of the categories that are a little bit erratic. But uh, overall, revenues are, are very close to target. And I don't think November is going to change that too much. And I think, so November is coming in a little bit light relative to the projections. But that, that's mostly because um, the, the forbearance that was granted uh, back in, in um, uh, June and July for the uh, uh, payments of some taxes, we kind of thought that would be more impactful than it turned out to be. So that's part of why revenues are running stronger now. And November didn't provide quite as much kick as, uh, as we would have um, uh, thought. But still positive. So, um, you know, the takeaway from the revenue picture is things are pretty much on track. Don't expect some gigantic windfall. And there are a lot of challenges in the second half of the year, so uh, uh, stay tuned. Uh, I, as was mentioned, there are crises around every corner that we don't see, and we've got to respond to them all. We've experienced that with some of the conflict in the Middle East and, uh, uh, and elsewhere, and so things come out of uh, nowhere and can uh, create real challenges. So. Um, uh, personal incomes have been the, the category that was the, the largest over target, but it's pretty much been balanced by uh, higher refunding than expected in, in, the, in corporate receipts. 
Uh, other than that, uh, estate, interest, and lottery have been strong, but those are really volatile categories. So, you know, in lottery, if you get a big jackpot, then you're going to get a lot of people playing and you get more revenue. Uh, with interest, nobody really knows exactly when those returns come in. The treasurer's new at handling this much money in the way it's being handled. So some of those returns are just erratic month to month. Um, I think we're, we're, we're good on the year, but uh, that'll bounce around quite a bit. And estate taxes are notoriously volatile. So that's, um, uh, those have all been strong, though. That's good. Um, Meals and Rooms has been uh, uh, a, a bit weak. S there will be some bounce back in November there. That one, I think we uh, maybe we're on the other side of the coin with respect to forbearance impacts. Um, motor vehicle purchase and use has also been weak. It's a big consumption tax that's been weak. And that, of course, is credit dependent. But interestingly, also, uh, uh, vehicle inventories are still really low. Uh, the, the auto strike wouldn't have impacted October revenues, but it will to some extent uh, November. And so uh, just not, there's not a lot of inventory out there. Prices are high and borrowing costs are really high. So 80% of all new cars and 40% of all uh, used cars are, are purchased with financing. And those interest rates are, are really high. I think it's 7.4% uh, on on new car financing, the latest APR, and 11.2 on used cars. That's, that's really steep. Uh, the share of people that um, pay at least $1,000 a month on a car loan uh, hit a record high uh, in the last quarter, 17.5%, paying more than $1,000 a month in um, uh, uh, car financing. Um, So, uh, yeah, so uh, anyway, revenues are very close. Uh, we'll talk about some of the uh, pieces of it. When I say, you know, generally growth is good, you can see kind of, uh, you know, this is GDP change annualized. And the last read was 4.9%. That's not going to, we're not going to stay at that kind of growth. But even if it drops to two, two and a half, that's still. Uh, uh, pretty solid growth and and keeps the economy chugging. Uh, so that's a plus. Everybody's talking about and familiar with inflation and where it's going and all that, but it's really come down pretty fast. It's going to be a lot harder to get from three to two than it was from nine to, to three, and it's going to bounce around some too. But this has been surprisingly... Uh, good. We really, ex uh, some of us expected it to stay higher and maybe even have further interest rate increases. That seems to be off the table right now. So, uh, you know, the Fed doesn't want to talk too optimistically, but the, I think it's a hold right now. How long the hold is, it, it could be a while. And that is what's primarily gradually slowing the economy more and more are the high interest rates in response to inflation. But if you look at unemployment, that's uh, uh, Vermont is the blue line and the United States is the red line. Um, you know, huge spike in the pandemic. But, you know, we've, we've had record lows recently. It's ticked up a little bit, and so has the United States. So um, in terms of, you know, if you want a job, can you get a job? The answer is yes. There's a... Whoops, there's a poll the Wall Street, whoop, there we go. Poll the Wall Street Journal does with 75 economists, and um, it's just more reactive than anything else. But it was uh, the last one dropped the risk of uh, recession in the next 12 months to a little bit under 50%. It had been a little bit over 50%, but uh, that, that kind of mirrors the, the general improvement that um, uh, people are seeing. There's a matrix of risks that um, uh, Moody's Analytics, who we use for some of the macro forecasting we do, puts out. And, you, and, and they started doing this. They had maybe six or, six or eight or so risks that they had. And every time they put it out, there are more risks. There's, now there's 20-something risks there. But uh, as you go up that, that 
uh, angle. Let me see if this is a pointer. Is that a pointer? Yeah, it's a pointer. Um, the, so as you go up this, and you can't see it because this thing's blocking the axis, but this is the impact on the economy on this axis, and this is the likelihood of any of these things happening. So things that are out here would have a really high impact on the, on the economy, but if they're down low, they're not very likely. So the thing that's the most likely and the most impactful is still Federal Reserve missteps, that they'd keep interest rates either too high or, or too high too long, and, and that's typically what, what's happened in the past uh, in causing recessions. Anyway, there's a plethora of things that uh, uh, could cause uh, uh, the economy to, to, to be challenged. Some of them are self-inflicted things, like the, you know, government shutdowns and this sort of thing, but um, uh, there are a lot of external events that can, uh, that can happen as well. So I mentioned the interest rates being the, the uh, key thing that's slowing the economy. That's the purpose of them, is to slow the economy. But the idea is just slow it enough that inflation comes down and it doesn't provoke a recession. That's what's called the soft landing. And uh, right now, the chances of that are better than they looked six months ago. But you do see just you know the impact here. It's pushed. Uh, so this is the, the uh, federal funds rate, the effective rate, probably around 5.333 right now. And the 30-year uh, fixed rate mortgage is uh, top 7.6% recently, it moves around a bit, but that's pretty high. And then prime rates even higher than that, like eight and a half. So, and then other interest rates build on that. I think there was a slide early on that showed, uh, you know, the, the, the interest rate on credit card debt, almost 25%, you know, so, and, and credit card debt has been mounting. Um, crazy way to borrow money, but it's too, e I mean, it's made to be easy, but, you know, 24, 25% interest, it's a killer. So uh, that's problematic, and there have been more, more credit card defaults lately, uh, so that's, that's something of a concern. So high interest rates impact some sectors more than others. The idea is that any, anything you're having to borrow money for is going to be more expensive, so there'll be less of it. Uh, but some things are, are really dependent on that. Real estate uh, is, is, is one of those. Um, vehicle purchases is, is, are, are another one that um, uh, we've mentioned. Um, and uh, commercial real estate in particular has been uh, hit by both. It, it has regular refinancing needs, and there's been a big demand shock from the pandemic. So office space is much less valuable and much less needed, and uh, so there will be defaults and strain on the financial system, certainly in, in, you know, from that sector, um, but it, it affects a lot of activity in the economy. This is uh, the, 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 just the inventories on, um, uh, for uh, 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 vehicles on dealer lots. And you can see you know, how low that, that's been, if I can get the pointer there. Uh, and it's only up a little bit from the worst of the, of the pandemic. So that, that supply uh, uh, hasn't really loosened up, and that's limiting purchase and use uh, revenues. Uh, National housing starts uh, down about 27% in the last year and a half. Uh, so as the interest rates bite, there's just less and less new construction. Home sales are down. Um, prices are still up. They're going to be dropping, but there's been a huge run up in price. So part of that's been asset appreciation in general, but uh, real estate in particular, uh, housing has been uh, has, has had record levels of price increase. And there have been big cycles in the past. I'll show you in a few charts. Um, so this is a chart that we uh, run every six months with all, you know, with the forecast, because it shows where Vermont and other states land relative to the last cyclical peak and relative to the last trough. In general, Vermont and some of the other northern New England states have been moving 
uh, uh, up that chart, if you just look at the second quarter of 2023, and the third quarter data just came in, uh, so, so the chart before it's based on third quarter data, but in the second quarter of 2023, uh, Vermont had the highest year-over-year -year home price growth in the country. So 10.9% uh, was the highest growth uh, price um, uh, appreciation, and second was Maine. Uh, and you see there that uh, New Hampshire and Connecticut were also pretty high. So um, uh, Maine has been particularly strong on a more sustained basis than Vermont, but some of that's pandemic effects where you had a, had a, uh, a much more uh, uh, movement of people, migra migration to some of these areas, um, but it, it is really straining affordability uh, with housing. The, this shows that same data over time, only for Vermont, going back to 1984. And you see there are three big cycles that have occurred in real estate. And they're not necessarily coincident with economic cycles, but quite often uh, they are. Um, when you get increases like this, there's only one direction they go. So the red bars are actual and the green bars are forecast, but there will be a, either a steep decline or a prolonged period of uh, slightly negative or very flat uh, uh, house price appreciation. In the meantime, people that own houses, and it's the largest asset that most people own, are seeing net worth go up, but anybody trying to buy a house is really confronting not only high prices for the house, high borrowing costs as well. And supplies being limited because people that have a house that might sell it and maybe trade up or, or move somewhere else will be losing a mortgage that maybe is three or 4% and they have to get one at seven or 8%. And uh, so that's just bringing housing transactions to a, a, a standstill. And that has implications for the education fund and grand list uh, assessing. If there are very few transactions, it's really hard to get a, a, a clear CLA adjustment so that you're looking at really an equalized price across areas. And, uh, and when there's really quick appreciation like this, um, uh, it, it, it also skews a lot of the data. So. Um, uh, that th the reason this is important for revenues is that it, it directly feeds into the uh, education fund property tax, which is not one of the revenue sources that we forecast in January and July. It's one that we just finished forecasting October, November, and the tax department will be issuing a letter around that. Maybe they already have. But. So looking at the Burlington MSA versus the non-MSA areas, uh, it's interesting, at the, at the start of this, the, the Burlington MSA was just appreciating much more quickly than the rest of the state. But then when the pandemic hit, the non-MSA parts of the state really caught up. So since the last peak, the Burlington MSA home prices are about 80% higher, and they're about 66% higher in the uh, non-MSA, oh, the rest of the state. Uh, there's been a shift also in, in, in new construction, the response to those prices towards apartments and away from single-family housing. Single-family housing used to be the, the, the dominant part of a residential building in the state, and apartments are now uh, higher than that. In July, it was 62% of all housing starts in Vermont were apartments. So here's, here's what I was talking about with the, with the consumer sentiment uh, uh, information. So this is October 2023. This is the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment uh, Survey. And, you know, th this is where it's at. This looks like it's in the depths of, you know, recession. I wish that thing on the bottom wasn't there, but I, I think you tried to move, get rid of it last time and couldn't. Um, but anyway, uh, if you look at the dates, that's, that's the, uh, um, the Great Recession. And that's, where pe that's what people are saying they're feeling about the economy. 
Um, one, uh, uh, you know, the, the disconnect comes when you say, well, how are you feeling about it? Uh, normally, if you're in a downturn like the recession, people aren't spending. So they say, I feel bad about things. I can't afford anything. I can't. And, they, and it shows up in spending. There's nothing happening in spending. So people are complaining about the economy, but they're spending like uh, things are pretty good. So that's also part of the disconnect. And that's where it matters to revenues, is if, if consumers keep spending, we're still getting tax revenue through a, a variety of sources that, that, that key off that. Um, so this is just, you know, cartoons about the same. One of the things that Michigan uh, started doing on a regular basis just recently is, and, and they did some of it back farther, but there are big gaps in the data, is they started reporting it by party affiliation. So they asked somebody, if, if you um, identify as a Republican or identify as a Democrat, how do you feel about the economy? And you can see there's a, a pretty extraordinary gap between, so the red line is Republicans and the blue line's Democrats, and then the one in between is total, the blue line with the dots, and independents are the green line that are there. So that pretty much right splits the difference. But here's the Trump presidency right to where the lines cross pretty much, and there's the Biden presidency. Now, looks like the Republicans swing both higher and lower, you know, from, from the, the median, there's sort of more intensity perhaps around that, but, uh, but there's a clear, you know, it lens that people are looking thing, at things through. And probably more importantly, there's a clear lens for where they're getting information about the economy, so how it's being cast. And social media definitely uh, uh, plays into that where lots of people are only getting news now through social media. You had a question. As it relates to anticipated revenue, you track the savings rates? Uh, yeah, well, savings and net worth are both, yeah, both really important because that's dry powder that can be used to buy stuff. And we're seeing actually a fair amount of private lending too. So, you know, you're getting, okay, interest rates are high, but somebody really wants to sell their home, they'll finance it, you know, they'll provide financing, they'll do, you know, so. And then the other thing is, is people's expectations about how long they're gonna be high. So some people say, all right, I'll go ahead and do it because I, I, I think their rates are going to drop and then I'll refinance. And then, and then I could afford it then, but I just have to hold my breath for a year or two. And, you know, then, and, but I still want to get in on it. So, yeah, that, that is happening. But, yeah, uh, so there was a lot of savings and in, uh, in, in various, uh, to various degrees of liquidity, right? So some cash some, you know, things that people bought, uh, but, but net worth went up dramatically uh, through the pandemic. And so that's providing a lot of the spending power that people have. And that's diminished rather significantly, but still, uh, still there's a fair amount of capacity. <laughs> um, Labor markets are still really tight. Uh, unemployment rate is one reflection of that. Um, anybody who employs uh, you know, as a business and, and tries to keep or get new uh, workers knows how difficult the market is. Uh, and um, uh, job growth is slowed, but it's still positive. Uh, fortunately, it hasn't been so strong that it would motivate further Fed interest rate increases. When the economic news comes out now, there's always this sense of like, if it's too good, then the Fed's going to react by raising interest rates. And you feel like it's a good number, but it's bad because it's going to cause something worse than what it was. And if it's low, then sometimes you're saying, oh, well, that's good. The Fed's not going to get excited about a number like that. But this has sort of hit a, you know, job growth has been a little Goldilocks spot where it's not too hot, not too cold, and uh, uh, still growing. Um, labor force participation's been rising. I'll show you a chart on that. And especially among older uh, workers, though, is it's well below pre-pandemic levels. So the, a lot of the loss in labor force participation has been in with, with older workers, 55 and over. 
Uh, wage growth has, has been slightly above headline inflation. Um, there have been a lot of union actions. You, it's gotten a lot of press and, and very successful contract negotiations from the perspective of the workers. They have more power now. So they're able to use that uh, and extract uh, uh, a lot more. It's just that a very small uh, share of the total labor force is unionized. But those agreements still have impact on, on other workers because the other workers see it and say, hey, I ought to get something. And so that does tend to push things up. But, but wage growth, it, it, it's a little bit more than inflation. I think that's the, the way people perceive that, too, I think feeds into sentiment. Because if you get a wage increase that's like 5% or something like that, you want to believe that it's not just a cost of living adjustment but that you've done a good job and, you're, and your employer recognizes that. And if then you go out to buy things and everything's at least 5% more, uh, you know, from the numbers on the page, you're saying, oh, well, your real income's still up a little bit. But it feels bad because you sort of thought you deserved more, but when you try to turn that into anything you're getting, it's so much more you're treading water. And psychologically, that's that's a downer, and um, I, I do think that's part of what feeds into it. And we haven't had inflation like this for a very long time, so it's new to, to a lot of the working population. Um, so there's a job growth chart. This is, you know, the, the growth each, uh, uh, each month, and you see the green bars are just piling up, but they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, but that's exactly what the Fed's trying to do. That's the unemployment rate. Vermont's still way up high, as we almost always are, so uh, very low unemployment. Um, the, these, these charts on job openings and uh, the number of people employed, I think probably to say more about the tightness in the labor markets than just the unemployment rate. But that gap, you know, the number of job openings and the number of unemployed people, you know, it's usually, usually they're more unemployed than there are job openings. Right before the pandemic, it did, you know, flip the other way, but this uh, is unprecedented and uh, speaks to the tightness. Uh, uh, some of that, too, though, is that I think employers that listed job openings, because it's been hard to get workers, a lot of times they keep listings up in the event that they're need. They want a flow of applicants so that they can, uh, uh, you know, replace people as needed. But uh, so it might that may be affecting the data as well. But it, but I don't think there's any question if you talk to employers and uh, and workers and everybody there's it's it's uh, still a pretty tight market. Uh, in, in Vermont, uh, it's even wider. There's an even wider gap. Uh, the data at, in small areas like Vermont is not as solid, so it's noisier. But the takeaway, it's about double. Uh, if you take the same ratio for Vermont and the United States, there are about three jobs, job openings for every unemployed worker in Vermont, and there's about one and a half for, uh, at the national level. So. Uh, Labor markets are still tight. This is the participation rate that I, I mentioned, and it's a little hard to see with that scale, but you know, in, in a, you see how smooth and flat the line is. This is the overall national participation rate. Dropped during the pandemic and sort of come back. It's getting close to where it was, but it's not quite there. But age 55 and plus, it dropped with the pandemic, and it's really pretty much flatlined. Oh, you can't see the, the words on that. I think if there's a printed thing, there's... Kind of, anyway, he's talking about we're substituting capital for labor, and we got uh, robots, but they're really smart robots, but not so smart that they would form a union. So that's... Uh, anyway. Um, there, there was a study two days ago that came out from the Boston Fed that we're always looking at demographic stuff because that's the core of all the economic analysis we do. 
And we'll be updating the single age population numbers for Vermont in December when we get new census data. But um, the Boston Fed did a study that I think is really interesting. You know, we, we've had a number of efforts to try to uh, do what we can to attract more people and, and, and workers to the state. Uh, uh, some of it effective, maybe, but a lot of it maybe not. But this is really interesting. It showed that 56% of the population growth in all of New England between 2010 and 2021 came from foreign-born residents, okay? So we can't affect immigration law. We you know, that's a federal thing. We, we, you know, we can't say we have a different immigration policy in the United States. But we can probably affect uh, how we welcome and treat and process and such uh, uh, immigrants. Uh, and it might even be easier than competing for general workers in other states to focus on this, the thing that jumped out at me is you look at every state in New England, they've gotten a pretty big chunk of growth between 2010 and 2021 from foreign uh, born residents. Vermont is down at the bottom there at minus 2%. So we got nothing from that. That would be pretty substantial um, and maybe would be a more effective policy angle than just trying to compete, saying, oh, well, we'll just pay any worker that comes here. I mean, what are the things that are needed to help integrate people into the economy? But that's a pool of people that we could actually perhaps uh, more effectively uh, recruit. But it's, um, it's dramatic in, in how substantial it was for all of New England and how minuscule, actually negative, slight negative, it was uh, for Vermont. Anyway, just a, a piece of news that uh, we had. So, um, and you don't need to see the caption for that. Uh, it's just something like, you know, clear as mud. Uh, anyway, if there are questions, um, I can, we can do some, some now. Yes, sir. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, again, for all these numbers, I, I, I would say the consumer part of the consumer upset, you know, isn't so much being able to buy things like, you know, online or what we measure. But speaking personally, you know, our my health insurance is going up five hundred dollars a month um, at interest rates. I can't move. Um, I've got a f less than a four percent mortgage. I can't move. So if I'm going to pay a thousand or if I'm going to pay a thousand dollars for a car, I'm not going to buy a car. Those are the things that are, I think, difficult to measure in our world. I mean, I keep pointing back to the Fed. All of this is the Fed. It's the cost of money. And so where does that leave us with all of these other things that we want to do? I want to see us build more housing, too. But if it costs twice as much of, our, of, the, of the way that we funded money, into VHCB and other organizations to build funding. And if it's costing those, you know, if we're, we're getting half as much yeah. housing with the same amount of money as we did five years ago, um, you're not a policy person. I, I can't ask you what are we supposed to do. But um, I, I, to me, that's why people, I think, have this real unease is that the cost of borrowing, the cost of, and we live on credit, is um, it's, way, it's way out of whack with what it's been. Yeah, and you know, if if the Fed hadn't raised interest rates to try to slow inflation, it would be wringing its way out or working its way through the economy simply by high inflation. So you'd just have really high inflation, you'd still have all the demand going and everything, but it would be really high price increases for a pretty long period of time, some of which can get baked in. but yeah, pick your poison. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't make it easier. I think the only silver lining, I mean, here's what the Fed would say, is they're not going to have to keep them there, this high forever. I mean, the highest in 25 years. 
So the hope is that sometime next year, and, and this is why the markets were so ecstatic the last couple of days, is they, you know, they, they saw hints that there could be uh, maybe some interest rate reductions as early as the spring. I don't think that's going to happen, but even if it was mid-year, it would start to relax things. So I think that's, that's the hope. But in the meantime, it, it, they're not wanting there to be as much activity such that you know, demand comes more in line with supply. But it's, um, it's a very narrow way to address the problem because you're doing it all through interest rate se sensitive sectors. And that's not sort of spreading the pain evenly. Yes. Is there a way to discern uh, the economic well-being or, or parse it by socioeconomic level? That is to say, um, those above the median income of Vermont are, have higher or lower unemployment. Wages are rising or lowering when compared to those who might not have as high incomes, et cetera, by household. Thank you. There, there are some of the economic metrics are, are broken out that way, but not very many. Uh, so um, uh, with respect to income, we look at that. Um, so if you did quintiles of income in 2022, which is the la latest data for that, there was a, 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 little, a little bit better performance at the bottom end. And some of the wage increases, too, have been slightly more. Now, they don't make up for 20 or 30 years of growing disparities. But uh, wage gains at the bottom have been a little bit stronger than wage gains in the middle. And uh, so it, it just is based on the mix of industries that, need, that are needing people at any given time and you know what that competition is. Um, yeah, I wish, I, I wish there were data in more of the indicators that would do that. Yeah. Uh, Tom, since you flagged uh, Vermont's performance uh, or lack thereof of attracting in migration from the foreign born, uh, I don't know whether your curiosity got you to look and ask the question, what are the other states doing uh, after your comment of our scattershot and unsuccessful strategy thus far? Uh, the study just came out two days ago. Uh, the, the guy who wrote it is a friend who's at the Boston Fed, so I, I really want to call him and I've got a ton of questions. But um, I, yeah, I just found it really interesting and, uh, and something we can actually do something about, you know, because it's sort of when you think of like, well, what does an immigrant confront when they come here, you know, language and and culture and customs and uh, transportation and just getting integrated with society. And I know we have efforts that do that. It's not that there's nothing, but I think that's exactly the first question to ask is, you know, what are some of the other states doing that we could replicate and how could we expand it? I, I have to comment, I was recently lobbied by the local adult basic ed people saying, you know, here we are, we're ready to do this, but uh, the word isn't out and the resources aren't there. Yeah, okay. Well, th that's, that's kind of where it stands, but just just seems like an area maybe that we could spend a little time with that. That's what, yeah. uh, other questions? Yes. Thank you so much for this briefing. Um, I'm curious about the levels of credit card debt increasing. My understanding is during the pandemic, because of the one-time um, funds that were provided to people, that they used that to pay off their credit cards. So are we kind of seeing us just going back to pre-pandemic levels of credit card debt? Yeah, I think credit card debt is close to pre-pandemic levels, but interest rates... <laughs> quite a bit more. And um, so that is a way that people have sort of maintained spending and uh, is a little bit of a train wreck waiting to happen. Uh, so defaults are up too. Um, but yeah, I think that's how some people are having to cope with uh, inflationary increases and um, but 
I, I can't see it ending well. Okay. Oh, Allison. So, Tom, I'm just curious about the impact, uh, to go back to your house sales and the challenges of, you know, selling a mortgage that you may have at 3% and having, having to shift gears. What impact is this having on our property transfer tax? Because while I think we are gaining by more expensive houses being bought at a higher level, um, we're also losing because very few houses are being bought. So what do you anticipate? Because obviously we fund things we care a lot about in terms of housing with that tax. Uh, I think it's a net loss for the property transfer tax, so it's a, it's a little bit less revenue. And it is a category that's running behind our expectations, not hugely, but behind. And and that's, that's the reason I think there are just so few transactions and, um, but, but I think it also raises that issue that I mentioned before, that it's really hard to calibrate what, the, what an equalized value would be if you can't get a good market read. And if you can't get a good market, if there's too few transactions, it skews that. And then if you go to a broader area or more you know, different types of structures, you, know, you can get a big, big enough sample size, but then you're you're uh, sometimes compromising the accuracy of the geography or the type of building. So, yeah. Yes. Well, thank you, Tom, for the presentation today. Um, one question I did have regarding some of the information that was put up there, I did see the graph regarding the trends um, on the increasing side regarding consumer spending. Now, in terms of the consumer spending, how is that quantified? Was that quantified in terms of uh, taking out loans for homes, cars, things of, things of that nature, or is that just lumping all consumer spending, including basics like groceries and whatnot as well? That's, that's a really aggregated category that covers a lot of things. And then there's things like retail sales and retail sales <laughs> without motor vehicles and without food and with, you know, so you can slice and dice it a lot of different <laughs> ways. But consumer spending has slowed, but it's, you know, but it's still plugging along. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not reflective, it's not consistent with sentiment at all. And usually those two are much closer, you know, people's sentiment is negative and that's, that's where they pull back. And the reason consumer sentiment matters is that it affects consumer spending. If it doesn't, um, as economists, we wouldn't care about it. It's just chatter then. Um, but how people act is what affects revenues and affects jobs and all that kind of thing. So that's what we're looking at. But it's unusual to have that much of a disconnect. So the, in order to follow up with that question real, real quick, and I, I won't spend too much time on this, but is there any way to possibly get that data broken down in terms of age demographics? Um, one, one issue that's been touched upon in this state is that our workforce is getting older and we're having less and less young people in the state. So I'm just curious regarding the spending habits because we're seeing this data saying that, okay, we're spending more money, but if you have a higher age population that has more of that economic influence, then it makes me wonder the next generation that's supposed to be filling those employees are retiring um, in terms of the economic resiliency that they have. Um, so that's one thing I'm particularly curious about if that data is available by chance. Yeah, that's, that's a complex topic is sort of, you know, what are all the different ramifications of an aging population on fiscal and economic activity in the state? And some are intuitive um, and some are counterintuitive. So a lot depends on the wealth and income of the individuals not necessarily how they're getting that income. So the idea is, oh, you're old, but you're not, so you're not working, so you're not paying in, and therefore, you know, somebody else is having to support you, in effect. And if the old person has a lot of income, uh, which quite a few do, uh, they're doing more for the, you know, supporting the fiscal strength of the state by paying taxes on that income, and somebody who's younger and earning less, but getting it through wages. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's complex, but it's, it's definitely something we look at. And uh, 
if you'd like to get into some of the details, maybe after the presentation or, or further, shoot me an email or let's have a conversation at lunch or something. Uh, Tom, why don't we take one more question and okay. then we'll move. one more question. Thank you. I have a question over here. Over here. Whoops. Can we have so, Catherine? Uh, let's do two. Uh, <laughs> So um, real estate sales analysis right now are um, analyzing sales that took place in the boom, which is causing the CLA to be artificially high at this point. So when the real, with the real estate market tanking, so to speak, um, will that not um, cause towns that reappraise to have artificially high appraisal values? Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't hurt to have a high grand list, but for citizens of Vermont to have their homes appraised more than what they can sell them for is not a good situation. Yeah, no, I think anytime there's a big swing up or down, and given the lags and the way these things work, it creates a certain amount of chaos and, and, and unfairness. And I'm just saying what's happened in the markets is, is going to, work its way into a lot of chaos, and you'll probably hear about it from constituents. And um, it won't be easy for PBR and town officials and assessors to sort through, uh, because statistically, it's going to be hard to just use the same old book and, and get values that are, you know, that everybody's happy with and thinks are fair. Yeah. Uh, okay, th this is really the last question. Okay, Tom, thanks. I'll make it an easy one. Especially thinking about the labor non-participation. Non when I speak to Vermonters who might want to work, or I speak with employers who might want to hire, one, one thing that comes up again and again is the opioid crisis, associated crime, and you know, issues coming in and out of incarceration. Do you see that in the data? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a huge issue, and uh, what we've seen is that when the labor market gets this tight, it actually does start to bring in some of the, some workers who would be considered less employable than usual. So to the extent it can give people a chance, that's really good. You know, they may have a bad record or they may have a bad, have had a really tough time, but maybe, you know, they're over and they'll be given another chance because it's so hard to get workers. But uh, yeah, it's, it is, it, there are a lot of things that have reduced participation, uh, but mental health, uh, uh, certainly drug use, and, and job performance in general. Uh, those are uh, important components of the whole thing. Okay. I, if I right. might, and I, I understand there are several questions in the chat. I apologize for not getting to them. The, if you have questions, please email askjfo at leg.state.vt.us, and uh, we will respond to you that way. Um, and thank you, Tom, for your discussion on the uh, economic and revenue review. Um, Uh, next up is a JFO presentation, and I, there are some familiar faces but have new roles, so I'm just going to briefly walk through who the order of presentation and then they will take over. Uh, Maria Beliveau is the Associate Fiscal Officer with the House Appropriations. Uh, Chris Roop is now an Associate Fiscal Officer and he's leading the revenue team. And Emily Byrne is now the Deputy and she is in charge of the budget team. And I will turn it over to you. Hello, I am Maria Blair, and I would like to welcome you all to the Joint Fiscal Office briefing. Um, we have about a half an hour to present several slides that focus on providing content for developing the FY25 budget. This includes a review of revenues and appropriations, the status of federal funds, and identifying some of the pressures that the General Assembly will likely have to address. 
We will answer the questions regarding the FY24 revenues and appropriations as follows. Where does the money come from? Where does the money go? What does the money buy? I think I might be going too fast. Okay, sorry. Um, so there are three key pieces of information that we'd like you to leave this briefing with. Over the course of the past few years, Vermont has been the recipient of an unprecedented amount of federal funds. In addition, Vermont's general fund revenue collections have been very strong. Because of the large amount of both federal and state funds, the General Assembly has made some significant strategic investments. Many of the investments made by the General Assembly will roll out over the course of several years. The third takeaway is that the official revenue forecast projects that the rate of growth in the general fund will return to more normal levels. This was one of the things that Tom Cavett just spoke to you about. As revenue collections return to more normal rates of return, the General Assembly may be constrained in its ability to make new discretionary expenditures. We included this slide for those of you who are not familiar with the Joint Fiscal Office, and there are some out there who are not. Um, while we were putting together this slide, it occurred to us that this is the 50th year that the Joint Fiscal Office has been in existence. We were established in 1973 to provide nonpartisan analysis of fiscal issues before the General Assembly. Per statute, we serve the four money committees, so that's the House and Senate Committees on Appropriations, the House Ways and Means Committee, the Senate Finance Committee. In addition to these committees, we staff the House and Senate Transportation Committees, as well as the House and Senate Institutions Committees. The staff of the Joint Fiscal Office is also available to any committee or member of the General Assembly. We strive to serve all who request assistance. Now we're gonna to move to a discussion of the context that you will be working within when developing the FY25 budget. We included the next two slides to review some of the things that the state has had to contend with over the past several years. These events and issues are not the sort of things that we generally are faced with, and they have tested the ability of the state to respond. This list does not include every issue and is not in any particular order of significance. As you build the fiscal 25 budget this coming session, many of these things on the list will be part of your discussion. First on the list is natural disasters. Vermont experienced significant flooding this past July and will continue to have it to address future disasters. The opioid epidemic is still very much with us. The COVID-19 epidemic has faded somewhat, although people are continuing to become sick and the effects of the disruptions that the epidemic caused are still being felt around the state. Vermont has struggled with the high cost and access to childcare. Access and the scarce childcare labor force continue to be issues. Vermont is officially the state with the second oldest average age in the country behind Maine. This impacts the economy, the labor force, housing, and a myriad of other important issues to our state. As you are aware, Vermont has had the benefit of unprecedented amounts of federal assistance over the past few years, much of it related to the COVID-19 epidemic. These funds provided the state with opportunities for investment to support Vermonters. In addition to the federal funds, Vermont's general fund revenues have been very strong. As noted, the official revenue forecast does not include this level of revenues moving forward. Vermont has experienced a significant shortage of housing, especially for low and moderate income households. In addition, the inadequate housing inventory in Vermont is challenging the state's ability to shelter the homeless population. The next bullet point refers to the economic environment that we all are living within. Although inflation has eased somewhat, we are still experiencing the effects of inflation as well as the effects of high interest rates. The final two bullets reference the high rate of turnover in both the General Assembly and with staff throughout state government. And this has resulted in recruiting challenges as well as high vacancy rates. So now I'm going to turn you over to Chris Roop. Thank you, Maria. All right, as most of you probably know, there are three major funds of state government that pay for the vast majority of programs and activities, the general fund, the education fund, and the transportation fund. 
we put a little graphic here just to put into context how much money comes through these various funds in the overall picture of the state budget. You also see that federal funds, like all other states, federal funds make up a very large share of our state budget. And we also have dozens, if not hundreds, of special funds that contribute um, pretty significant amounts of uh, money to supporting our state budget. Each of the three major funds, the general fund, the ed fund, and the T fund, all have their own dedicated revenue sources, their own dedicated tax streams. You can learn more about each of these taxes if you look at the fiscal facts book that JFO puts out at the start of every year, which is also posted on uh, the JFO website. We update it every year. So let's start with the general fund. You know, the major fund that supports state government with state tax revenue, the one that you all probably spend the most time thinking about is the general fund. The general fund is a relatively flexible pot of money and it's used to fund a wide range of government services and operations. The major revenue sources are expected to generate $2.1 billion for the general fund this year in FY24. You'll see here from the graphic that personal income taxes are by far the largest source of revenue to the general fund. Brings in more than half of the money. Corporate income taxes are another major revenue source. But there are also lots of other taxes that bring in smaller amounts of money. For example, the general fund receives 69% of the meals and rooms tax. And uh, there are also things like healthcare revenues here that show up. Those are your tobacco taxes, your provider taxes. Those funds run through the general fund, but ultimately are used to help us uh, match our federal Medicaid funds. You'll notice here that interest income is on the list. That's been a substantial source of revenue recently. It typically has not been a very big source of revenue, but our state's cash balances have been unusually strong these last few years due to a lot of the federal COVID relief money that has come through. And obviously interest rates are at levels that we haven't seen in several decades. So interest income has gone from just being a few million dollars a year to being a pretty substantial source of general fund revenue this year. That's not expected to be in perpetuity though as uh, the cash balance starts being spent down in future years. Let's go to my favorite fund, the transportation fund. The, sec the second one I'm gonna talk about, uh, you've all heard about the T fund. It's expected to bring in about $304 million this year. The T fund primarily supports the agency of transportation, which includes DMV, but it also supports the costs, some of the costs of operating the Vermont State Police and BGS. Much of the T fund is also used to match federal transportation dollars that we get in. Vermont is a big winner when it comes to getting federal transportation dollars. The T fund is where the gas and diesel tax revenue goes, along with the fees that DMV collects for things like your vehicle registrations and your driver's licenses. The T fund also receives two thirds of the revenue from the purchase and use tax, which is like a sales tax on motor vehicle uh, sales and registrations. The ed fund gets another third of it. And there's also some miscellaneous revenue sources that are smaller. Over time, the purchase and use has grown as a contributor to the T fund as uh, demand for vehicles has been stronger in the pandemic era, era and prices for vehicles has increased. The gas tax, on the other hand, has continued to diminish over time, and that trend will likely accelerate in the future. Let's look at the third major fund, the ED fund. The ED fund is expected to bring in about $2.2 billion this year. The ED fund is a little bit unusual. The ED fund is driven by spending decisions rather than the amount of tax revenue that's available in the forecast. What I mean by that is all of your local schools make their own local spending decisions. Those spending decisions made at the local level, along with the spending decisions made here in terms of appropriating ed fund dollars, dictate how much money needs to be raised out of the ed fund in the coming year. There are non-property tax revenue sources that are dedicated to the ed fund, such as the sales and use tax, the uh, quarter of the meals and rooms tax, the third of the purchase and use, lottery proceeds, what comes in from those non-property tax revenue sources gets factored into the funding equation. So we figure out how much needs to be raised based on the spending demands on the ED fund, how much is likely to come in in revenue from those non-property tax sources, and that difference needs to be made up through the property taxes, which are set every year. 
So these major funds are a big part of the revenue story, but they're certainly not the whole story. Like other states, Vermont receives billions in federal funds each year, which are reflected throughout the budget and often require a state match to draw down. Vermont also has what we call the Global Commitment Fund to support Medicaid and other health investments and hundreds of special funds that are set up to fund specific things. The Capital Fund is something that our institutions committees are very familiar with and that historically pays for physical construction projects with a relatively long useful life, often using bonded or borrowed dollars. But in recent years, we've been paying for more capital projects using cash rather than borrowed funds. Now let's pivot back to the general fund. Now this is my doom and gloom slide. This figure shows you how the available general fund revenues have trended over the last two and a half decades, not adjusted for inflation in the blue line, and then the red line is adjusted uh, by inflation to be in uh, 1998 dollars. So one of the things that really jumps out when you look at this is that revenues are not a perfectly straight line you actually see dips that correspond to times of economic challenge. You can see the Great Recession in the, the late 2000s really impacted the general fund. Look at the recent years though, in the early, two, the early 2020s that coincided with the COVID-19 pandemic. We had a really, really significant spike in revenue collections for a few years, really peaking in FY23. But look at the forecast on the right side for the future years. Uh, right now, the, the July consensus revenue forecast actually expects general fund revenues to dip down below the FY23 levels and not exceed those FY23 levels again until FY27. So what I'm trying to show you here is that the COVID era really juiced up the general fund for a time, but we're starting to see that momentum slow down and we expect revenue collections to start to reach the more modest levels of growth in future years that Vermont is accustomed to seeing uh, before the pandemic era. This slide shows you the year over year changes in percentage in available general funds. So you'll see here that uh, in times of economic difficulty, we had negative revenue growth, which uh, relative to the prior year, which you'd kind of expect. Um, but COVID-19 in 2022 really, really spiked up in a year-over-year -year revenue gain. But moving forward, those gains in year-over-year -year revenues are expected to be much more modest. They're expected to be much more like what we've seen in the you know, quote unquote normal years in the early 2010s where Vermont typically saw growth in revenues way less than 5% a year. So right now the forecast expects that those really unusually strong years in the COVID-19 era are going to sort of fall behind us and moving forward our collections are gonna look more like what Vermont is accustomed to seeing. This chart shows you uh, the um, where the general fund revenues are through October of this year. So the good news is that revenues are, uh, cumulative revenues uh, through that month are above the July forecast by about $30 million. You get to that by comparing that blue column in the middle with the green uh, bar on the right. But that's not the whole story because that July forecast expects us to bring in less money in 2024 than we did in 2023. So we are indeed slightly ahead of the current forecast, but we're actually slightly behind where we were a year ago. The July forecast does not expect the T fund or the ED fund to decline relative to last year's collections, but both of those other major funds are also expected to grow at slower rates in the future. So now that I've shared that wonderful news with you, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Emily Byrne to walk you through uh, some more details about where the money goes and what we buy with it. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Great to see you all today. Um, I'm gonna do the expenditure side and then wrap us up, hopefully pretty quickly. So first we'll go into where the money goes. So if we look, as Chris had alluded to, there has been significant growth in the general fund um, and other funds over time. So this chart is just to sort of demonstrate that by showing where we were in 2020 compared to where we were in 2024. 
When we look at those charts, you can see um, with the general fund, we had almost $770 million, or about 48% increase from 20 to 24. And in federal funds, we had about $872 million, or a 38% change um, in available funds. So that's a pretty significant amount of money that's been available to the General Assembly to appropriate over the last four years. When we look at where that money went, we can look at this chart, which is a sort of an overview of appropriations from FY24, and you can see two pretty distinct bars on this. The first one is about $3 billion of the $8.5 billion that was appropriated last year. About a third of that went to human services. So most of that is the Medicaid program, but other human services related programs. You can see by the chart that about half of that spending is federal funds. Um, the federal government matches the Medicaid program and the state is required to contribute sort of our share to that. So a big chunk of spending um, is through the human services. The next third is for the K through 12 spending. So a lot of that is, is how the state appropriates local budgets and state um, the property tax. But we think of the budget, the two big sections, human services and K through 12 education. And then the other third is everything else that state government does. So the next largest bar is transportation, um, but everything else from natural resources to housing, et cetera, is that other third of, the, of state spending. So when we go to, so what does that really buy? What do we spend $8.5 billion on? So approximately a quarter of the $8.5 billion is buying things like state employees, personal services contracts, paying for buildings, everything from the state house to the offices that state employees occupy, software, computers, hardware, et cetera, to sort of operate state government. But then the remaining three quarters of that money is sort of going out the door, if you will. That's going to pay Medicaid providers for Medicaid services. That's for contracts to pave roads and build bridges. That's grants for clean water projects, um, unemployment benefits, general assistance benefits, et cetera. Those are, that money is all sort of leaving state government and going to pay for services for Vermonters. So at a high level, we think about the general fund um, as sort of the most flexible fund that's available. So we've got about 400 special funds. The General Assembly has dedicated the revenue um, that goes into those special funds for specific things. So the general fund we sort of think about is our most flexible fund that's available. But flexible is sort of a relative term when you think about where all that, those dollars need to go. So in FY 2024, we had about $2.3 billion in the general fund that could be allocated. So if you think about sort of where all that money went, the first thing we have to sort of subtract from that 2.3 is the $330 million of one-time appropriations that happened in 2024. So those appropriations reflect revenue that's not gonna reoccur, right? We've heard a lot about from The Economist and from Chris that there was some excess money. The General Assembly made some one-time investments and things that will not reoccur with that money, but we have to assume that sort of that's not available next year. Then we take into account our sort of long-term liabilities and our debt payments that we have to make. So we gotta pay, we're speaking about credit card debt, we gotta pay our debt First of all, if we don't pay the debt this year, it just makes borrowing and our debt more expensive in future years. So we gotta meet those obligations this year. And we think about those as the teacher's pension and OPEB contributions, but also our debt service. So after we think about those, the debt that we have to pay on an annual basis, and we look at the Medicaid program. In FY 2024, the Medicaid program was nearly $650 million was the state share. So once we pay for the Medicaid program, then we put, we thought about the corrections system. So to the extent there is a population of folks that we have to take care of in the corrections system, that's another $180 million of general fund to pay for that. After that, there's about $400 million that goes to other human services programs. So that's everything from childcare subsidies to GA and emergency housing, child protective services, et cetera. So those six things, so that's only six, gets us to $1.8 billion, which is about over three quarters of the general funds available. So on the one hand, that's six items, 75%, that's a lot. But then you may say, well, Emily, that still leaves $551 million, that's a lot of money. We can do a lot with $551 million, which is true, except for we think of all the other things that state government is responsible for taking care of, and that $551 million has to pay for everything else. So that's all of the elected offices in, uh, in the executive branch, in the legislature, the attorney general's office, treasurer, et cetera. 
public safety, including the state police, housing, natural resources programs, economic development programs, the Agency of Agriculture, labor and workforce development, the judicial system, including the courts, the state's attorneys, the defender generals, the general fund costs related to state employees, higher education contributions made by the state, the requirements that the state has to match federal funds, the homeowner and renter rebate, to fund the tax department to make sure that the money actually comes into the state, climate change, mitigation and resilience expenses, and other core services. So just wanted to sort of demonstrate that yes, $200 billion, $2 billion is a lot of money, but once you actually look at and parse out where all that money has to go, there isn't very much left at the end. Ooh. So at a high level, just wanted to do, you know, talk generally about best budgeting practices, best things to keep in mind when you're thinking about the budget. Um, we talk a lot about base versus one-time revenues. Base revenue are really the revenues that reoccur. And you want to use those base revenues to cover your, you know, reoccurring costs. So when I think about the budget, I sometimes compare it to my own personal budget. So that's thinking about my mortgage or peanut butter or groceries or gas, right? We want to make sure that I have money coming in all the time to pay for those sort of those reoccurring costs. And then we have these one-time revenues. And you want to make sure you set aside the one-time revenues for things that aren't necessarily going to reoccur every year. So I have to get my chimney relined next week, right? I want to make sure that the money that, money that I've set aside and saved, I can use to do things that are those like one-time expenses. <clears throat> reserves. So one thing that the state does have, um, just wanted to touch on, we do have significant reserves. Um, and these are important. This is money in our savings account for just in case you do need to get your chimney relined so your house doesn't burn down, right? Or um, other sorts of things that are unexpected. A good example of this um, is say there was a global pandemic and we don't really know what's gonna happen to state revenues when that happens. Knowing that we had cash in the bank and that we had money reserved to help continue to operate state government as we figured everything out was really critical. Um, it's also an important thing that rating agencies look at to make sure when they look at whether or not they're, what the state's borrowing rate should be is the state being fiscally responsible and setting money aside. Um, it's just good financial planning to make sure that there's some money set aside in our savings account. So there are several different types of reserves. The big one, the statute stabilization reserve is sort of what we think of statutorily. It's typically 5% of prior year appropriations. But there are other types of reserves that we have. There's a rainy day reserve. There's one up there that's called the 2753rd Reserve, which is our sort of forward payment on the 53rd week of Medicaid and 27th payroll week, that financial anomaly that happens every once in a while. And rather than have a one-time expense, we've decided to amortize that and set money aside. So there's money set it aside in anticipation of those expenses. We've also created a PCB reserve in the education fund to help school districts that find that they have PCBs in their buildings and need a little bit of extra financial help to take care of that. So we'll do a real quick touch on federal funds. We talked about you know, a lot of additional general fund in recent years. There's also been a significant amount of federal funds, but I'm not gonna get too deep into it because Marsha Howard is gonna speak in more detail about federal funds. But so we're starting to return to business as normal when it comes to federal funds. Um, Vermont is often sort of a winner when it comes to federal funds because we receive what's called a small state minimum on a lot of grants. Most federal grants are allocated on a per capita basis unless the population of your state is really small compared to other states. So those states with small populations like Vermont sort of receive a minimum amount of federal dollars, so we get more on a per capita basis than larger states. Um, federal grants typically have lots of strings attached and are used for very specific purposes. So the feds don't generally just write us a check and say do whatever you want. They say you gotta target it for specific purposes. They may require that the state have skin in the game and includes matching requirements. And additionally, sometimes it says you've got to maintain your level of service to, to uh, citizens of Vermont, otherwise we won't continue to provide the funds. And federal funding is always complicated by things we hear in the news. Um, so what's going on in Congress and how con federal agencies are interpreting the congr what Congress has passed. Luckily right now we're sort of past another shutdown window, but there is another one coming um, in January and February and how those federal funds will get dealt with in continuing resolutions is something I'm sure Marsha will go into way more detail on. 
Um, so this slide is just like a high level reminder of what we did with all of the one-time federal funds that came through. So those federal funds had specific limitations on what they could be used for. Um, and this chart just shows where they were appropriated in, 20, in the FY22 and the FY2023 budget. So economic, the economy, workforce development, uh, housing, broadband, climate change, and clean water programs. So one of the major pieces of federal legislation that we hear a lot about is the American Rescue Plan Act, often called, referred to as ARPA. One of the ARPA funds were given to the states, Vermont got over a billion dollars, um, and given a certain time frame to spend those dollars. And there's a lot of terminology that's thrown around around these federal funds and just wanted to make it sort of clarify what those are. So um, by the end of December 20, 31st of 2024, the state has to obligate all of the, the American Rescue Plan Act. And what obligate means is that it's committed in a grant or a contract or a purchase order where there's been a commitment to buy something with those dollars is what obligated means. Obligated does not mean appropriated. So the role of the General Assembly is to give the executive branch the spending authority to make those obligations. And for the most part, most of those dollars have been appropriated by the General Assembly and the executive branch is out obligating those dollars. The ARPA funds must be expended by December 31 of 2026. And expended means that we've paid an invoice, we've written a check, we've said, Somebody has completed the grant or contract work that state government has asked them to do, and we have given them the money for that. Currently, um, most of the funds have been, have been appropriated. They are working on obligating and expending those dollars as we speak. Um, and one of the things that's important about the ARPA funds, Chris alluded to the fact that interest rates, the interest inc income for the state has gone up significantly. This is because unlike most federal grants, the federal government with ARPA gave states the cash up front. Typically what happens with federal grants is the state spends the money, tells the federal government, we did what you asked you to do, and they pay us back. In this case, they've given us the money up front, which means, and they've allowed states to keep any interest that they earn on that money, which is great for our balance sheet. However, the, at the end of this, U.S. Treasury will come and look and see what we've actually expended and they are to recapture those funds that haven't been expended or obligated. So we will have to give back anything that we haven't spent at the end of 2024. So a quick look at FY 2025. So each summer, so in August, the governor sends budget instructions to agencies and departments. The budget instructions that went out this fall, this summer, asked agencies to keep their spending increases to 3% of their FY 2024 appropriations. So it gave them a little bit of an increase, but just for context, there were a lot of there are a lot of cost increases that these agencies and departments must manage. That includes a 15% increase in health benefit costs. The Pay Act in FY 24 included a 2% COLA and a 1.9 average step increase for state employees. There's also inflationary costs that impact the cost of doing business for state agencies, internal service funds, which cover the sort of internal overhead operations of state government for everything from buildings to the HR, to HR um, and IT services, costs are going up. Additionally, the, child care, the state government has to pay the child care payroll tax that was passed last year, so they need to absorb the increased expense associated with that. There's the new family medical leave insurance program and increased retirement system costs all need to be absorbed within that 3% um, increase that was outlined in the governor's budget instructions. So just to bring this point home again, right after several years with additional federal stimulus and extra robust general fund, our revenue growth is projected to kind of go, to go back to normal. And those additional federal funds, we've received over three billion um, will not reoccur going forward. JFO sat down and you know sort of went through what are the, some of these big spending pressures that are facing Vermont that will have to be managed in the budget. And this list is not meant to be um, everything, but just at a high level, some things that are spending pressures that will be challenging in the next budget development. So we continue to have, un we ha have unfunded liabilities and there continues to be cost pressures associated with those. Flood recovery and required FEMA match to help communities that were impacted by the floods in July. Additional housing initiatives, issues associated with the opioid epidemic. There's continued caseload and programmatic pressures in DIVA and the Medicaid program and DCF emergency housing and in the REACH-UP program. 
As we, although apparently Tom didn't know the letter came out yesterday, we all know that education spending <laughs> has gone up, is going up significantly and will be a cost pressure. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that the December letter is the sort of starting place for education spend, the education spending conversation. It sort of says, you know, based on what we know and the information we have today, this is what we anticipate education spending to be and what tax rates will be as a, as a result of that. Obviously, local school districts take that information and go back and do work and come up with actual budgets and those budgets um, and ed spending will be settled in this, you know, come winter and then ultimately at town meeting day, we'll be able to finalize those numbers. But the letter was really the, the starting place for that conversation for districts in the General Assembly. Some other issues, so the, the pay and cost of state employees. This is a year where the state employees union will be negotiating with the administration um, a new collective bargaining agreement. IT projects are constantly an area of um, spending need. There are federal match requirements for FEMA and other places in state government. Inflation continues to be a pressure. Climate change mitigation and resilience discussions, and there's also demographic and workforce challenges that sort of underlie revenue collections and a lot of things going on in the state. So for the upcoming session, just some things to keep in the back of your head in terms of best practices when it comes to budgeting. So funding those base expenses with ongoing revenue and strategic investments with one-time funding. Being diligent about the revenue outlook in, first, in future years in relation to inflationary costs and expense pressures. Not only do we have to think about what spending decisions mean for this year's budget, but sort of what do they mean in the out years and going forward. Understanding and maximizing federal funds and where match is required. Assessing and understanding the status of current program investments and whether or not need, changes need to be made going forward. And continuing to pay down and manage the state's long-term liabilities. So this, is a, this slide is a repeat from the, the slide that Maria spoke about at the beginning. Um, and just some key takeaways, hopefully, We've managed to drill some of these down um, through this presentation. But so in the last few years, we've received an unprecedented amount of both federal and state funds that aren't anticipated to reoccur in the coming years. Um, increased revenues in the pa past couple years have resulted in significant one-time investments. And these funds will be spent over a period of years, and we'll see the fruits of that labor um, in the future. State revenues are, effect, are anticipated to return to a sort of more normal rate of growth in 2025. And there will be, demographics will challenge that. It may mean that requests for spending will likely outpace rev, available revenues and producing a balanced budget may be a challenge this year. I'd be remiss again if I didn't give a shout out to the JFO website at the very end of this. Um, you can get to it either by going to ljfo at or, or you can get to it directly from the General Assembly's website. Um, there's a lot of good information out there about a lot of the issues that we spoke about in budget documents. Um, but with that, I will take any questions. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so you spoke about the recapturing of funds in 2024. Is there any way that the federal government could dispute funds that we have obligated? And in addition to that, is there any way a new administration could claw back funding that we've already appropriated or recapture things that we might have expected? Sure. So I think the, um, there will obviously be a lot of back and forth with the federal government when we get to that time period in terms of what will, be, you know, state government has done its job to document and ensure that they have the paperwork that says we've obligated these funds. Um, I can't speak to whether or not a future administration could do anything with funds that have already been allocated. Um, that's, that's a legal question, I think. Um, do we have time for more? Is there one more? Okay. Yeah, sure. I haven't heard. Can you tell me where the cannabis revenue has ended up? The cannabis revenue. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but we can get back to you on that. It is doing better than we anticipated. Yeah. We want for Peter. And I, I just want to apologize to the people on Zoom. We are having some technical difficulties with the chat function, so apologies up front. Um, I'm just going to ask you one more time to use Ask JFO if you have a question and we weren't able to get to it. Should we do Peter? Okay, do one more. Yeah, Peter. <laughs> Representative Anthony. Yeah, thank you very much. Emily, 
Uh, has there been any kind of um, structural shift in the balance of expenditures between labor, that is to say wage costs, as opposed to capital expenditures or um, investment uh, as a result of some of the uh, extraordinary investment by the federals in uh, Vermont's economy? Uh, that's a good question. We haven't really looked into that. I do know, I mean, most of the, the one-time money was made in capital-type investments, so long-term infrastructure-type projects rather than paying for, you know, the ongoing costs of state employees, if that's makes sense. I just asked that because to the extent to which uh, that investment uh, in the longer term is, uh, results in labor substitution, then the structure has changed. Thanks. Great, thank you. Please thank the executive. Thank you. Uh, that is some food for thought. Um, and now we're gonna hear from Marsha Howard. She's the executive director for the Federal Funds Information for States. She helps to translate federal proposals and, at, and bills into terms that we can understand. And Marsha will be on Zoom. I think uh, we'll see if we can take her live. Marsha, are you there? We'll see, just a moment. Marsha, are you there? I am here, yes. Wonderful. There you go. Please, you, it's all your show now. Okay, once I figure out how to share, we're going to be good. There it is. Sorry, that took too long. Good morning, Vermont Legislature. I'm uh, happy to be with you again this year, and sorry it's not in person. I am mindful of the fact that I stand between you and lunch, so um, I will get right after it and, and see if we can get through this and shave a few minutes off your, um, your agenda. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the big picture and then you know, start at 50,000 feet and then move on down getting you know, closer to 10,000, 5,000 to talk about some of the uh, impacts that federal funds have on Vermont. At the very highest level, you know, we talk about grants, but really federal funds find their way into states through four fiscal flows. Grants are one, procurement or buying things, when the feds buy things, that's a, a second. Salaries, federal salaries are a third. And then the fourth and largest is direct payments. And I mentioned these four just because we do so often focus on grants to the exclusion of the others, even though the others, while they don't necessarily contribute to the state budget resources directly, they certainly contribute to the state's overall economy. And we can see from this chart over time that the um, trend has been very heavily for direct payments to drive those federal dollars into states. You'll see on some of these slides that my data end at 2019. And the reason for that is that through the COVID pandemic, federal funds were so different from what they are on a baseline year that we have tried to take those out of some of these numbers just to give more of a, a sense of what things are like absent some extraordinary event like the pandemic and the effect that had on the flow of federal funds generally. So let's get down to what we do talk about at Federal Funds Information for States, which is the grants piece of, of those flows. We'd like to present this slide, and again, this is from 2019. If it were from any year after that, these high pieces would be very different, but this is more what they're likely to be over. <laughs> so when we talk about federal funds, we're really in the federal budget process, mostly talking about 
that slice at the bottom that's non-defense discretionary. The other pieces are mostly already set in federal law. And they don't, the, the, the Congress doesn't have that much say over them except in um, unusual circumstances. So of course, we know Social Security and Medicare uh, dry, you know, account for a large share of the federal budget, but we have Medicaid as well. And of course, those are grants to states, but they're very targeted to a specific purpose. Then other mandatory <laughs> there that that's some of your larger um, entitlement programs that you do run. And of course, defense is down there, and that's a large piece. And the other one that, you know, really bears consideration now is net interest, because as the Congressional Budget Office does projections of future gains on federal spending, that net interest money uh, slice is going to get bigger and bigger, both because the federal government spent so much money during the COVID pandemic but also because interest rates are rising. And so the modest interest that the um, federal government has had to pay up to now is probably gonna start to grow rather significantly going forward. It was mentioned in previous uh, presentations that the federal government you know, really stepped in to help states during the pandemic. And it's often true that the federal government steps in to help states during recessions. So if you look at this chart, the blue bars show the federal funds that are spent by states in each year and what they represent as a share of state spending. And if you go back to the far left, you can see that there was a recession around you know, the 2003 number of reflects um, extra federal fiscal relief. Of course, the fiscal years um, 2009, 2011, and 2013, we have some of the money from the Recovery Act after the Great Recession. And then we see, of course, a big spike in federal funds spent by states in fiscal year 2021, and that those federal funds counted more than 40% of state spending in that year. So really a huge increase in the role of federal funds in state spending um, during the pandemic. When we look at how states do on grant funding and which states get a lot and which states don't, and again, this was referenced in earlier presentations, there are really four major determinants. One is your state Medicaid program. Do you run a robust program? How, what's your federal matching rate look like? There are about a dozen federal or a dozen states that receive the minimum matching rate of 50%. But for the other states, those Medicaid matching rates vary. And of course, the more the federal government pays, that means you're getting more money into your state for that program. And did you adopt the American, um, the Affordable Care Act Medicaid expansion? When we look at how states do on grant funding, in general, the states that have adopted that expansion receive more federal funds on a per capita basis, which makes sense. The second is income and poverty. And so many federal grant programs are driven by formulas. And so many of those formulas have components that look at income and look at poverty as uh, criteria, formula factors for distributing federal funds. So everything else being equal, a lower income state will receive more federal funds. A state with high poverty will receive more federal funds. The third criteria or factor is population. And this just came up in the previous presentation about these small state minimums. These ensure that states that have, you may have a low share of the national population, but the small state minimum guarantees every state, say at least two, two and a half percent of funds. And in a state like Vermont, your population is well less than two and a half percent of the national total. So you really benefit from these small state minimums. But in addition, it's the demographics of your population. We talked about Vermont being an older state. And so as an older state, you'll end up getting you know, more of the funds that target that type of population. In a state like Utah, that's a very young state, it may do better on formula grant programs that target school age population, for example. And then the final one is geography. And this is 
not such a big factor um, in Vermont and other states east of the Mississippi in, in general, but a big issue out west. And we just put out a brief today on federal minerals management payments. And if you're New Mexico or Wyoming, that's a huge source of income for those states. If you have large federal land holdings, you get to share some of the income that's derived from extracting minerals from those lands. Um, so natural resources can really drive uh, additional federal funds. And how this plays out for each state is shown here. And this is from fiscal year 2022, so it's a little more up to date. And you can see that nationally grant federal grant funding per capita was just over $2,700. And then there to the right, you see Vermont, which does do well at 33.59. Um, and of course, the District of Columbia is an outlier because it has a special relationship with the federal government. But next to the District of Columbia, you'll see New Mexico, which I mentioned. And New Mexico has sort of a perfect storm in this regard because it gets a high Medicaid matching rate. It has a high poverty rate, it has low income. So it sort of wins it under all the criteria. As you see there, um, Vermont does quite well, and many of the states that benefit from that small state minimum are clustered on the, on the right of that chart. And the notable example, exception, I guess, is New York. And New York mostly does um, as well as it does because it has a very large and very expensive Medicaid program. Looking at the grants and how they flow and where, where they come from, most of them come in the area of health. It, Medicaid is the tail that wags the dog, as it were, in federal grant funding. So that accounts for well more than half of all grant funding is in the area of health. Income security is also an important source. Transportation and that piece probably will grow a little bit. Um, as a result of the inflation, uh, I'm sorry, the infrastructure um, and Investment and Jobs Act that was passed. <laughs> Education, training, employment, and social services are uh, another piece. And then everything else is just 5% of that, of that total. Federal grants are a little bit top heavy. So, and again, Medicaid, right, you know, just alone, as you can see on this graph, is um, about 60% of the money states get is just in Medicaid. But this lists the top 10 programs in dollar terms, and then what they represent is a cumulative share of grant funding that goes to states. And so just these 10 programs together account for 80% of all federal funds. We've had some questions on this, and this has come up a little bit, the next two in some of your discussions today, about mandatory versus discretionary. And I said most of the federal and decisions they make are really on the discretionary side. And if we look at the 224 programs that we track in our grants database, almost 80% of those programs are discretionary programs. They are and 21% are mandatory programs. So most of the programs that states get, most of the grants states get from the federal government are part of this discretionary budgeting process. On the other hand, the dollars associated with it are much different. We check the, the account for this $687 billion here, and most of that, 76% of those dollars flow on the mandatory side. So even though di the discretionary decision-making affects the majority of programs, it affects a relatively small share of the funding that flows to states, accounting for only 24% of the total. And again, this is 2019, so it, it's absent that, um, that COVID infusion. And then we get to non-formula or competitive and formula grants because one of the objectives of state, especially in an environment where you're looking at fewer federal funds probably flowing by formula, is to say, well, let's make sure we get any money on the table. Let's make sure we go after all the competitive grant funding that we can get. 
And so this takes the same database that contained. And you can look here and see that if you look at um, all of the grants out there for which states are eligible, the vast majority of them are non-formula grants or competitive grants. But then on the flip side, look at the dollars associated with those grants, you'll see that very few dollars are attached to the competitive grants. Rather, almost all of the money really flows through formula programs. And so formula programs are way more important to what's available to states. But I'd like to say here that there are two really important exceptions to this that are recent. One is the bipartisan infrastructure law or the the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Yeah. And second is the Climate Law or the Inflation Reduction Act. Both of these pieces of legislation had large federal appropriations that will be made over four or five or six years. And those appropriations fund many programs that are competitive programs for which states must apply to win the fund. So those are important sources, uh, not exactly one-time funding, but sort of one-time funding because a lot of them are like capital type investments in resilience, climate, various infrastructure, broadband, those types of activities. So there is a large uh, amount of competitive grant funding out there right now that uh, Vermont and other states should be looking out for over the next few years. So pivoting now to where we are in the federal budget process this year, it was mentioned that we've avoided a shutdown so far. We are now operating under a second continuing resolution. The federal fiscal year began on October 1st. Under this second continuing resolution, four of the 12 uh, major discretionary appropriations bills have been extended until January 19th, and the remaining eight have been extended until February 2nd. So those are listed here, and I would call your attention in particular to two, I'd say, that really account for almost all of the money states get on the discretionary side. One of those is transportation HUD, and so that's expires first batch and labor, health and human services and education and that expires in the second batch and under this continuing resolution there are other provisions that are relevant to states there are um, programs that must get funding outside of the appropriations process uh, or I'm sorry to say inside the appropriations process. And if they don't get that funding, they can't operate. So TANF is an important one of those, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. That program and the funding required for it um, were extended to February 2nd. Importantly in this um, continuing resolution, the Farm Bill was extended through the end of the fiscal year. So through September 30th of 2024. Community health centers, which receive mandatory funding, got funding through January 19th, and those funds, those mandatory funds were appropriated at 1.2 billion through that, that date. And then finally, a few programs that are associated with the sort of community health, public health center um, project area, sexual risk of lotus education, and personal responsibility education program, both received mandatory funds and that funding was provided through the 19th of January in continuing resolution. And then secondly, the CR delays the um, of the Medicaid disproportionate share hospital cuts. These were passed as part of the Affordable Care Act back in 2010. They were supposed to take effect, I think, in 2014, and they have been continually deferred, 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 deferred. So here we are almost 10 years later now, and those cuts have still not taken effect, and for now at least, are deferred until January 29th, but certainly likely to be um, deferred beyond that once final budget decisions are made. 
One of the reasons that Congress has been unable to resolve the budget is that the House and Senate are working from very different play cards. Yeah. You may recall that a debt deal was passed earlier in the summer, and it set spending targets for the budget process in 24 and 25. And so it appeared at that point that it was going to be pretty smooth sailing with agreement on top line discretionary budget figures. But what happened is that the House came in and said, we don't want to live with those numbers. We want to cut further than that bill, than that debt relief bill um, specifies. So this chart shows the difference, and it's not all 12 appropriations bills. We just took the handful that really have the most impact on state and local governments. But the first one is, of course, you know, the, the elephant in the room, and that's labor, health and human services and education. So the Senate numbers abide by the um, what's it called the Deficit Reduction Act. <laughs> And the House came in with these lower numbers. And you can see in just this one bill, there's like a $50 billion difference between what the Senate's appropriating to and what the House is appropriating to. And it, it carries over into all of the others with the exception of Homeland Security where the House actually came in higher and the Senate um, is at the lower amount. And so, look at these numbers, you can see that getting to some agreement between the House and Senate is going to be virtually impossible until they figure out what that top line number will be. And these are so far apart right now that it's really hard to know or predict, forecast, or even imagine how this gap is going to be closed in the coming weeks. So the Fiscal, uh, the, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, this law that raised the debt, had provisions governing how this budget process is meant to go. And as I said, it set targets for what discretionary spending could be. But they're a little bit, they have sort of incentives and disincentives, and it's really kind of super complicated, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway. So the $767 billion is what 2023 non-defense discretionary spending is, was. And under the FRA, for 2024, the cap set spending at 704 billion. And that's, as I said, the number that the Senate is working off of. And then the House is working off a lower, much lower number. But then the bill has this provision that says, there's a resolution in place as of January 1st, then this bill is going to set the discretionary spending target at 1% less than the 2020 amount. So that's the 736. So if you're in the, you're looking at this and you're like, well, we can appropriate at the cap and that's 704 or, oh, sorry. Or we could just um, keep on doing continuing resolutions, knowing that eventually they'll impose this 1% cut. It's like, well, we're almost better off doing the continuing resolutions and taking the 1% cut because that gives us more than the 704 gives us. And importantly in that bill, the 704 is what's specified but there was this side agreement that you may have read about that was sort of based on a handshake that says, well, we'll do these little gimmicks and we'll do these other little tweaks and other things to boost that 2024 number above 704 and bring it more or less in line with the 767. So that agreement can't even they can't even live within what's in the law, let alone what was done on a handshake with a former House Speaker outside the law. So that side agreement, I think, is largely viewed as something that's going to fall by the wayside. So what we really have here is these three laws, and you can see why there could be an incentive for um, at least the, the, the Senate and the House Democrats to live 
these continuing resolutions, knowing that the pain will be less from them than it would be from the underlying legislation. Um, looking at some of the more specific things that are happening for um, states going into the next budget cycle, the federal matching rate for Medicaid has been recently announced for fiscal year 2025. And you can see here that most states are going to see decreases in their federal Medicaid matching rates. However, Vermont is to receive the second largest increase in its federal Medicaid matching rate. So even while you're losing the additional federal funds that came from the, the, the bump up that came during COVID, uh, you will be seeing at least in the federal Medicaid matching rate, and that's a, a pretty good bump, 1.44. On the other hand, the clawback is the um, share of the savings that states received from the Part D Medicare prescription drug benefit. And every state has to, to pay to the federal government a share of those savings, and it's calculated every year. And the FMAP is part of what goes into those calculations. And because it happened with the FMAP over the course of the coronavirus, pandemic, what's going to happen in calendar year 24 is that those payments are going to go up a lot for everybody. And so I guess, you know, relatively speaking, this is good news for Vermont, because you'll see that your increase is among the lower increases, but it's still 15.9%. So um, a big increase for all states, but um, relative to many states, Vermont uh, is going to do uh, uh, get hurt a little less, I guess I would say, by that by that increase. We have a bunch of stuff out there that can help you with this. I know there was a lot of talk about um, matching and maintenance of effort requirements that the state has to fulfill. We've just updated our publication that shows all the grants and whether they have these things and how much they are. We put out a competitive grant update every week that highlights, especially under the infrastructure bill and the climate bill, new grant opportunities that are available to states. Um, we're tracking appropriations so that when the House and Senate make decisions, you can see and compare what those look like com uh, relative to current funding. And we have enormous spreadsheets that we've devoted, especially the COVID one is actually enormous. And then the infrastructure bill and the climate bill as well that track all the money states are getting um, through all this legislation by state, by program, by year. So a whole bunch of stuff available to you. Um, the Joint Legislative Fiscal Office is a big user of our stuff. And so I'm sure uh, they can help any legislators who are interested in looking into any of this further. And that is all I have to share with you today. As I said, I know it's uh, lunchtime, but if anyone has questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, I know, I wanna, thank you. Um, if, if there's one question, I'm gonna, I'm looking around quickly. I think everybody wants, well, why don't we break for lunch? If you have any questions, you can come talk to me and I can connect with Marsha later and we can follow up with that that way. And we will see you back here at one o'clock. Thank you again, Marsha. Thank you everybody who's talked this morning. <laughs>